QuickBooks Online 2024 Sales Receipts Form. Get ready and relax because it's so easy using QuickBooks Online, you'd think it'd be a crime. But it's not, unless you're doing bookkeeping for bad stuff or something. Anyways, let's do it. Here we are online in our browser, searching for QuickBooks Online Test Drive, looking for the result that has Intuit.com in the URL, Intuit being the owner of QuickBooks, selecting the United States version of the software and verifying that we're not a robot. Opening up our major financial statement reports like we do every time, going to the reports on the left-hand side, right-clicking on the balance sheet and opening link in new tab. Same with the profit and loss, otherwise known as the income statement, right-clicking in and open link in new tab. Let's take a look at those tabs that have been created, middle tab. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us but but that's okay whatever because our merchandise is is better than their stupid stuff anyways like this cpa thinking cap for example cpa thinking cap you see what we did with like with the letters and this cpa thinking cap is not just for cpas either anyone can and should have at least one possibly multiple cpa thinking caps why because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the Matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey is saying. So get one, because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Close in the hamburger, there's our balance sheet tab. And to the right, close in the hamburger, there's our profit and loss report. Let's go to the first tab. This is the setup process we do every time. Data input on the first tab, looking at the results of that input on the tabs to the right in the financial statement and related reports drop down we've been looking at the customer cycle remembering that customers for quickbooks means the side of the table where we have our customers people that are going to be ultimately paying us for goods and services that we provide and that could be done quite easily or be a little bit more difficult of a cycle depending on the industry that we are in and the possibly the size of the company the easiest way would be a cash-based system possibly with like a gig work system even easier than a cash-based system in that we wait till the deposits clear the bank and just record them with a deposit form using the bank feeds and that would be the simplest system but you might have a cash based system where you can't do that because possibly you're at a sales register and you have to use the sales receipt form because you want to record the sales as you make the sales you want to have the double check of the internal control over those sales before you actually go to the bank and make the deposit and then use the bank feeds or bank reconciliation to double check the deposit we talked about in prior presentations where we might have a, an accrual system where we have an invoice the invoice is an accrual document it increases accounts receivable and accrual form in which case we would then have to receive the payment at a later point in time so this time we've done the accrual thing and we've looked at the deposits directly now we're going to the sales receipt type of format now that's the that's the form you can kind of imagine as though you're at a cash register you had a food trucks or a restaurant type of thing where you're making sales at a particular location and when you make the sales at the particular location you clearly want to record the sale as you're making the sale in other words i can't make the sale at the food truck or something like that or i wouldn't really want to i wouldn't have as good internal controls if i then wait till i take the money after i I made it during the day, deposit into the bank, and then wait till it clears the bank. 
The reason that's not typically the way to do it is because then I can't really track the receipts, the sales as they happen and match them out and tie them to the deposit. So what we typically want to do then is record the sales as they happen and and then you know make the deposit into the into the checking account in such a way that will match what actually physically goes into the checking account which again is more of a problem with the sales receipts because it's likely that we're going to get different forms of payment which might include cash and might include credit cards both of which are are an issue that i can't record each transaction directly into the checking account because that's not how it's going to appear in the checking account due to the fact that we're going to group multiple sales transactions together when we make the cash deposits at the end of the day possibly or when the credit card batches the deposits together to go into our account so let's check it out we're going to we're going to imagine we're at a cash register we'll go into the sales receipt here and let's just make a new customer again customer number one again i'm making it again because i closed the file down and i'm opening it again and i'm not going to put an invoice in it notice that the sales receipt is less likely that it's going to be an external form it might be you might still be printing this out and providing it to a, a client for example but uh it might also be more of an internal report as you record the transactions right so i'm going to say this happened on 01 as opposed to an invoice, which is clearly an external form because you'll be emailing it most likely or giving it in some way, shape or form to a client. So I'm gonna say 015524, let's say. And we're gonna say, let's say that this one is gonna be a cash sale. So we'll imagine that we're getting cash Say, Well, let's start the first one with like a, a check. Let's say it was a check. And I'll say the reference number is the check of that and then if it was a check, then maybe I don't need to go to undeposited funds, but I can put it directly into the checking account. So if you were making, if you were using the sales receipts for whatever reason, uh, and you were not having to invoice people, but they were paying you for one thing at a time, possibly a large purchase or something like that. And you know that they're going to hit the bank with one at a time, like a check would, the check's going to hit the bank one check at a time it's not like i'm going to group the checks together or if they're electronic transfers of some kind and you know they're all going to hit the bank one amount at a time and not be grouped together by like a credit card company or by grouping cash deposits together then you might be able to put it directly into the checking account which would be the easy thing to do although note that when it goes into the checking account it'll show as a sales receipt form instead of a deposit form and that makes it a little bit more difficult when you're searching for the increases to the checking account it would be nice if they were all deposit forms uh, but we'll see that in a second so let's go ahead and say this is going to be let's say this is for uh hourly so, well let's let's make this one a service item so I'll, I'll do this one a service so we'll just call it service item item one and I'm just going to make up this would be the easier kind of transaction with a service item as opposed to an inventory item. We'll do both of them here. Let's start off with a service item. And we're just going to say it's going to be dude price 150. Let's just say it's just going to services income. I'm going to say that it's not sales tax because it's a service item, possibly not subject to the sales tax to make the first one simple. And then we're going to say save it and close it. And so there we have it 150. So there's our basic sales receipt with no sales taxes would be the easiest one that we can see. We can add lines. If I had multiple lines similar to an invoice, we can clear the lines. We can have a message uh, to display to the sales receipt. If we were to provide it to a client, that might be something you wanna add. Message displayed to uh, on statement, you have the attachments you can cancel you can clear you can print or preview let's check that out we're going to print or preview it here so we'll print and preview it doot, doot. and so there it is so you can check that out we're going to close it back out and then you can make it reoccurring if it's a reoccurring transaction you can customize it if this is a form that you're providing externally it might be worth customizing you can copy it in the more section void delete 
transaction journal history, we have the save, and we have the save and send. And what is this going to do? Well, it's a sale. If I do the just a normal journal entry over here, just to say sales receipt, what's it going to do? It's going to go right into the checking account because that's what we made it do this time instead of an undeposited fund. And the other side is going to go to some kind of income. And we said it was for $150. So there's the journal entry. You could check it out. Cash is going to be going up and income is also going to be going up so net income is increasing down here so let's record it and check it we can save and close it we can go into our balance sheet run it and we're going to say okay let's go into the checking account checking out the checking close this out and hold on, I'm gonna go back and change the dates. I need to change the dates. Run the dates. Let's go from 010124 tab, 123124 tab. Run it to refresh it. Going into the checking account once again. And so there it is. There's the 150. If I go into that 150, that will take me to the sales receipt. Closing that back out, back to my reports. On the income statement, range change, date range that is, 010124 tab, 123124 tab, run it to refresh it, there's the 150. Now note with the sales receipt, we don't have as much detail, we don't have this accounts receivable we have to track. So we don't have that sub ledger that I have to deal with, which is nice. If I go to the internal documents, it's less likely that we're as needed to track the information over here, but we might have some issues, right? So if we go into the sales and I wanted to track the sales receipt, I could go into all sales transactions. I'm gonna close the hamburger for now. And I could look at, uh, I could look at the sales receipts, closing this back out and there's the sales receipt that we had. We can check it out, but we don't have to collect on it. So it's not as vital as the invoices. It doesn't have its own tab over here because the invoice is, if a customer had a question about a, about a transaction, we can go in here and we can go into that particular customer and check it out as well. Now note, if you're at a food truck though, or what any kind of one-time one-off sale type things, you might not have repeat customers and you might not have all of their information because you're just creating a receipt. So you might have everything under there as one customer and create, you know, as you're creating basically receipts or something like that in which case you wouldn't have all the details for each particular customer it would depend on the industry as to how how much detail you would have by customer so so if i go back on over now let's imagine that we do it again but this time it's going to go into undeposited funds because and we'll make a couple of them going into undeposited funds i'll also make it a little bit more oh, what that's an invoice hold on let's do it again with the sales receipt. I'll also make it a little bit more detailed in that we'll make it an inventory item, noting that the sales receipt is basically the similar form as an invoice. The, these are the two sales documents, sales receipt, invoice, invoice increase in accounts receivable, sales receipt, instead we get paid at that point of time, increasing therefore either the checking account or some clearing account like undeposited uh, funds. So, so the look and feel of it will be very similar in terms of the sales side of the transactions down below. So we'll sell an inventory item. So this is going to be customer number two. And I'm just going to set that up and tab in through it. If we wanted to email it, we'd have an email address. I'm going to make this on the 16th, 17th, let's say. And let's say this was cash this time. So let's imagine we're selling these things for cash. Well, if I sell it for cash, I don't want to put it directly into the checking account because it's going to be in my check register, not in the checking account. And because when I put it into the checking account, it's going to be grouped as one lump sum with multiple cash sales, right? So I have to put it into undeposited funds. Similar thing with a credit card payment. Okay, so let's make a new product down here. I'm just going to call it item one. So we're selling item number one. I'm going to add that. And this time I'm gonna make it an inventory item. We'll talk about adding inventories more in detail when we get to the to add to the part of the course where we do a new company file, but let's just take a look at it now. We've got an item, 
no SKU, we're not gonna add an image, not a category. Quantity on hand, I am gonna add a quantity. I'm gonna say there's 10 of them on hand already. This will create a journal entry. In practice, normally we wouldn't do that because normally we would wanna buy them and with a bill or a check form. But here we wanna focus on the sales form, so I wanna put them on hand here. Let's put it as of the beginning of the month of December and reorder point, I'm not gonna add one. Inventory, that's gonna be the account impacted, increasing when we purchase inventory, decreasing when we sell the inventory, we are selling the inventory at this point. Sales price, let's, make, let's say we sell them for like $50 and it's gonna increase the sales account. When we do that, that's what we're doing right here, we're selling them. The sales tax is being generated, so it's gonna be calculating the sales tax so we'll allow that to add a little complexity. And let's say that we purchase them for $35. Let's say $40. We purchase them for $40. So we buy them for $40. We sell them for $50. All right. Let's save it and close it. And let's say we're going to have, uh, let's, let's say just one, we'll just say one of, we'll sell one of these. So there's our thing that we're selling. <laughs> and uh, so, so then this is going to be a little bit more complex of a transaction similar to the invoice when we sold inventory because now we're tracking the inventory and we have the sales tax so what's this going to do it's going to be an increase not to accounts receivable like the invoice but rather to some kind of cash account this time undeposited funds because it's not going directly into the checking account because we have a cash payment so we want to take it in and out of the clearing account that's going to be for the 54. the other side then is going to be going to the income account but only for the fifty dollars the amount that we charge the difference four dollars the tax is going to be going to a liability account and then we're going to also have a decrease to the inventory of i think forty dollars which isn't on the sales receipt but it's known because the item is telling the system that and cost of goods sold is going to be going up by forty dollars the net impact on net income being the $50 minus the $40 or $10. And you can have the inventory tracking for the item that has been set up on a subledger tracking by item. So it can actually be a fairly complex uh, transaction. Now you might also ask, why don't I record the revenue at $54? instead of a liability of the sales tax. And then when I pay the sales tax, it would be an expense of doing business. That would kind of make sense. The idea is that the tax is imposed on the customer, not on you, the business, even though they're, they're just making you the tax collector. So it's not income to you. The idea is that it's gonna be off the income statement on the balance sheet, increase in the liability, and then you decrease the liability. Again, your client, a client, if you're a bookkeeper might ask you, why don't I have a sales tax expense as a deduction when I'm doing my taxes? I pay a lot for sales taxes. I should have an expense for it. And the reason is because you, if you do it this way, the income of the sales tax also didn't go on the income statement. Both of them are on the balance sheet. Okay, let's, let, let's record it over here just to check it out this way. If I did, if I did it this way, let's just modify this one. I'm gonna say, okay, so now we had, what's gonna happen here? Well, cash is going. Now it's not cash, but I'll put it into cash. It's really going into undeposited funds, but cash. And then we have the sales and then it was for $50 and then sales tax, sales tax payable is gonna be equal to the 50 times 0.08. I think it was 8% a negative sum of that. So that means we're getting $54 and then the inventory is going down and cost of goods sold is going up for $40. And so cash is gonna be going up, although it's gonna go into undeposited funds in our practice problem. I'll just, you know, we'll have a different step, but then we're gonna say then the income down here is going to go into income and sales tax payables up here on the balance sheet sales tax payable and then we're going to have the cost of goods sold is going to go up and inventory is going to go down nothing's currently in inventory so i get a negative inventory impact on net income the 50 dollars sales price 
minus the $40, and then we owe the sales tax uh, in the future, all right? So let's check it out. Save it and close it and check that one out. So I'm gonna go to the balance sheet and run it to refresh it. And we'll say that this time we put it into undeposited funds. Undeposited funds goes up by the full amount, $54. Scrolling down, there's the $54. Mui B to the N, B, N. Closing this out, back. Going to the income statement, running it to refreshing it. And we can see there's the $50 in the sales, not including the, not including the sales tax. And then let's go back on over, find the sales tax. Where did that go? Went into the liability on, over here to the board of equalization because that's who we owe the sales tax to. There's the $4 on that one. Let's go back. And then we know that the uh, inventory is going down. Let's go into the inventory. We have a decrease of the $40. That $40 is not on the actual sales receipt, but is known by the item because if the item set up, we said it was $40 for the cost. Closing that back out, back to the balance sheet. The other side's on the income statement. Cost of goods sold, $40. Net impact on the income statement, 50 minus 40, $10. Let's go back uh, to the balance sheet and look at that inventory, which now would need to be tracked on a perpetual inventory method if that's what we're using. Remembering every time you deal with inventory, you have to ask how, you don't have to do it this way a perpetual inventory method. You might be tracking it outside of QuickBooks using a periodic inventory system within QuickBooks, possibly tracking it on your Shopify store, or Amazon, if you're doing that kind of thing, or in a spreadsheet. But we're doing the full service perpetual system here. Therefore, we have a sub ledger. Let's right click on the tab to the right, duplicate it so that we can look at our sub ledger. Let's go to the reports down below and type in inventory valuation summary closing up the hand boogie changing the range up top from 01 let's let's go to 12 31 2 4 run it to refresh it now when we put the item on the books we said there were 10 of them so that means quickbooks did a journal entry to record 10 items at the date we said we we purchased them or put them on the books and then we sold one of them resulting in nine remaining so this is the inventory items. There's the 956.25 of all the inventory, which should tie out to the balance sheet, 926.25. Now let's do one more sales receipt so we can see them kind of grouped together. If I go back on over here and I make another one, let's make another simple one, another, another sales receipt. Let's say this one was customer, customer, Customer number three tab, save, and another cash payment. It's gonna go into undeposited funds and I'm just gonna make this the service item one to make it a simple one. So let's say the service item was, uh, was this is design service. I thought I made a serv service item one. And there's a 150, let's say we had two of those. So that comes up to 300. What's this going to do? It's sales receipt, it's gonna be increasing undeposited funds and the other side is gonna be going to the revenue. So let's go ahead and save that. Back to the balance sheet, check it, run it. Undeposited funds, going into undeposited funds. We now see the 300 and the 54 back on over the other side went to the income statement running it so in the income statement the service item we now have that added 300 for that one back so now the point is if i go back to the balance sheet if i take it out of undeposited funds and into the checking account i can use the deposit form to group those two items together so i can then go back on over and say okay let's go into the drop down and make the bank deposit, which I typically can't just simply wait till it clears the bank feeds because when it clears the bank feeds, these two deposits will be combined together. So what I have to do when I go into the end of the night, when I make the physical deposit into the checking account, I'm gonna go in here and check both of these off 
so that now it goes into the checking account at $354. So when it comes through on the bank feeds, I can simply match it to the amount here, the bank feeds then helping me with the bank reconciliation process instead of actually recording a transaction. So if I say, let's record this, save and close, go to the balance sheet, run it, that should be coming out of the undeposited funds. You can see, oh, it didn't do it again. Hold on a sec. I need to refresh it again. Give it a second. Give it a second. QuickBooks, I thought you were quick, QuickBooks. I thought you were quick. What? So this is going to be 54 ticking and tagging them off, 300 minus the 300. And you can see them ticking and tying off. But when it goes into the checking account, it's going to show up at that one lump sum. And so there it is at the 354. That's the that's the point. So that that lump sum is what's going to show up on the uh, on the bank statement so that when I go to the first tab, when I go into my transactions, when I go into my checking account and my bank feeds, when I see this come through, it's not going to come through as two separate deposits, but instead that one deposit. So I don't want to go into my checking account again. I know I'm stressing this point because this happens fairly often. People get frustrated. You go in here and you have to tie out different things to match out to here. If you have a credit card too, they might take out fees, which means your deposit won't even match, right? So you have to make sure that you have some kind of system on a cash based system. If you collect cash for those sales and you deposit it into the checking account, you're going to, you can easily make the deposit based on the cash deposit that you made instead of one sale at a time. If it's a credit card company, then you have to come up with some kind of system that you can match the batching process of the credit card company taking it in out of undeposited funds and depositing it into the checking account in the same amount so that you don't end up with a mess when you either do the bank reconciliation and or the the bank feeds trying to match out the bank feeds to your actual uh, deposits. Now, note that so, so that's that now it's possible we might talk more about the bank feeds later that you could enter the sales receipt uh, and put it into undeposited funds or something and then try to use the bank feeds to move it over to uh, to the deposit to actually record a transaction. We'll talk about that more on the bank feeds section, but that's not like the normal process people would do. Also, I just want to point out over here in the checking account that noticed like one of these deposits was the first way we did it was depositing the sales receipt directly and that would happen if you had just checks or something like that you can possibly do that but then you have a sales receipt in here as an increase as opposed to all the increases being deposits not a big deal but when for example we noticed that we could enter the receive payments as a deposit and we noticed that we could enter a deposit as a deposit and we now have the sale the re, the sales receipt that could be entered as an increase to the checking account so that means when you're sorting your checking account over here to try to look at increases to it you have not just deposits but now sales receipts and uh re payment and receive payment forms and whatnot which can make it a little bit more tedious to deal with if you're trying to search for something then if you used a system where you make everything a deposit form and then all the increases are basically the deposit forms.